children do things like this. They play, tease, and fight with each other. But when frightened, they look to each other for reassurance. It's hard not to think of young children as you watch young chimpanzees. Does their similar behavior have some kind of common denominator? Such questions are being asked by Dr. William Mason, a psychologist at the Delta Regional Primate Research Center. His answers may give clues to understanding the chimpanzee's social behavior, as well as our own. That's why he's exploring the childhood of the chimpanzee as an experiment. This is Kokomo Jr. He was born in Africa. He's three and a half years old. He lives in an apartment on West End Avenue in Manhattan. He's been in training since he was about three months old. He likes to play with toys, but he needs 12 hours of sleep a night and a nap every afternoon. He eats just about the same thing children do. Cereal, milk, fruit. One week it'll be uh, bananas, the next week grapes, the next week apples. He likes chicken and steak. He's fascinating to watch because he's so much like we are. Not quite, of course. And the differences are what make him so full of surprises. Uh, Kokomo Jr., this, will you pay attention to me for a minute? I'd like to know, would you like a glass of milk? Well, I assume he does. Just stay right there, I'll get the milk. Notice the way he holds the glass and that he drinks it very carefully, he hasn't spilled a drop. Here, you want to wipe your mouth? Here. He wipes his uh, mouth with a handkerchief and he can even use the handkerchief to blow his nose. We look and act alike in a general sort of way. We're supposed to have had a common ancestor millions of years back. How close is a chimpanzee to a man, physically? To get an answer to that question, go to what was once a flourishing rice plantation in southern Louisiana. Here, Tulane University built the Delta Regional Primate Research Center, one of seven such centers supported by grants from the National Institutes of Health. The research that goes on here is part of a national program in which health problems are being investigated with the help of animals most closely related to man, the primates. Here are offices, laboratories, and colonies of tree shrews, galagos, monkeys, baboons, and chimpanzees. Scientists from many fields come here to study them. One of these scientists is Dr. William Mason, psychologist and head of the Behavioral Science Division at the center. The body of a man and a chimpanzee, how alike are they? Dr. Mason answers that question. There are many physical similarities between men and chimpanzees which are obvious just by looking at them. They normally walk on all fours, but occasionally walk erect as we do. The size and shape of its head resembles the human, and inside that head is a brain remarkably like ours, so much so that only an expert can tell them apart. It has the same number of teeth as we do. The canine teeth that correspond to our eye teeth are quite large. In this young adult, they're only partially developed. We both have five fingers on each hand. At the end of each finger, we have flat fingernails instead of claws. With our thumb opposite our fingers, we both can pick up and manipulate objects. The hand of an infant chimpanzee looks similar to a baby's. Like the human infant, it's born toothless, later getting 20 baby teeth. It loses them just as children do. Like a baby, it's helpless and completely dependent. When separated from its mother, it must be given the same care a human baby would receive in a hospital nursery.
At the Delta Primate Research Center, all chimpanzees are examined using much the same medical procedures as with human patients. Newly arrived chimpanzees are placed in quarantine. They are subject to many of the same diseases and infections as humans. Dr. Smetna, whose laboratory is just down the hall, has diagnosed hepatitis in a chimpanzee. It could be the first step in finding out what can be done to control hepatitis in humans. To keep chimpanzees healthy, they need the same kind of food as we do with the same nutritional values. Breakfast is ready. Most chimps have their preferences. This one likes apples and oranges, which she carefully picks out. She eats with obvious pleasure. Her manners seem to be closer to the old Romans than to the etiquette of Emily Post. Because a chimpanzee's body, its needs and the way it functions is so nearly human, it's an excellent animal to study what goes on in our own bodies. There's a great deal of scientific evidence to show that of all animals, the chimpanzee is probably closest physically to man. Kokomo's body, mine and yours, are more similar than they are different. Uh, Kokomo Jr. Would you like to play a game of checkers? I say, would you like to play a game of checkers? Oh, all right. Just, just stay there. I don't think it'll be a fair match because I don't think he's played the game before. Now, we'll, we'll start with just one row of checkers apiece till you get the idea. So you put them like this. And I'll put mine over here like this. Now, the idea is that you move one square at a time and one checker at a time. And when, when yours get when yours gets like this, then you you can jump mine and you take it off the board. And off the, and you win uh, and whoever uh, that that's not the idea of the game. Well, it's not likely that a chimpanzee could learn to play checkers. But just how intelligent are they when compared to other animals and man? Here's Dr. Mason's answer. The chimpanzee seems to have an intelligence that is closest to our own. But just how close, we don't know. They're not little men in fur suits. On the other hand, they're intellectually superior to most other animals. Chimpanzees can use sticks as simple tools to help get food. The older chimpanzees seem to know more than the younger ones. The younger animals appear to have more curiosity, more intellectual growth than the adults. Children exhibit the same tendency. They seem to learn faster than adults. Young chimpanzees are inquisitive and full of surprises. This one was given an object wrapped in a piece of paper. After a brief examination, it rewrapped the pocket knife. This animal is a special pet. She has her own radio. She can even change stations, and she seems to prefer popular music. When a young chimpanzee is given writing or drawing materials, even for the first time, it often plays with them in much the same way a very young child would. While the pattern of growth is very much like ours, and some of their achievements are truly impressive, the chimpanzee never reaches the higher intellectual levels of man. They never develop a language, for instance. But of all the animals scientists have studied, the chimpanzee is closest intellectually to man. Thank you. Psychologists have found that chimpanzees are smarter than most other animals, but not nearly as smart as people. But don't you be concerned about it. You have lots of other qualities that make you very appealing. For example, you're very friendly. Yes, you are. I'm not just trying to flatter him. Young chimpanzees can be very friendly when they've had a chance to learn to respond to people. 
but they seem to have individual personalities, just as we do. How does it develop? Psychologists have found that our personalities develop uh, by how we learn to react to the things that go on around us, uh, especially other people. How do young chimpanzees learn to react to what goes on around them? In the chimpanzee's natural environment in Africa, it's extremely difficult to determine what factors influence the development of their personalities. Under laboratory conditions, the adult's social life is necessarily limited. When they do interact, most of their time is spent in grooming. Field studies and laboratory observations indicate the social life of adult chimpanzees is not nearly as complex as man's. Young chimpanzees, even in the laboratory, are active and playful. They seem to act like young children. How similar are they? All chimpanzees show a great deal of individuality, just as humans do. This is one of the things that make them so intriguing and at the same time so difficult to work with. Strong ties often develop between a young chimpanzee and someone they get to know. They enjoy being tickled and tossed around like a young child does. The young animals usually get along well together and spend a great deal of their time in social activity, much more than adult chimpanzees do. It's hard not to think of children when you watch young chimpanzees play. Sometimes they cling to each other, just like young children do. Clinging has real value to an infant chimpanzee. If it doesn't cling to its mother, it's not going to survive. This is not true of a human baby, so why does it continue to cling? Rough and tumble play probably has survival value to a chimpanzee too, but in a far less obvious way. What are the values of roughhousing to a child? We suspect that clinging and play are important to us as humans, but we don't know why. In the chimpanzee where these activities are simpler and more accessible, we might be able to find out how they operate and their influence on the development of personality. That's why we began to study the social behavior of young chimpanzees. The social behavior of young chimpanzees. How do you study it? They can do so many things. What part of their activity is due to emotional factors? Well, naturally, the first step is to observe what they do and then make a record of it. But that's not enough, is it? Somehow you'll have to isolate that part of their behavior that, that's based on emotional factors and then try to measure it. Remember Dr. Mason explained that young chimpanzees easily relate to man? Well, that was a clue to the study of their social behavior. The investigation begins with a chimpanzee's reaction to a man. Not a specific man, but the figure of a man that will come to represent one thing to the chimpanzee. And another figure of a man that will come to represent something else. We had to give our young chimpanzees an opportunity to learn for themselves what these figures meant. They usually approached the figures cautiously, hesitated, but welcomed the invitation to cling by the figure in green. When they felt secure enough, they might explore the room. When they approached the figure in white, they soon learned it would not allow them to cling. To cling, they had to go to the green figure. We kept accurate records of each chimpanzee's behavior. Before long, they all discovered the white figure represented play. Each of the chimpanzees in our test learned by trial and error that the green figure would hold them, 
and the white figure would play with them. We found in earlier studies that clinging and play were major social activities of young chimpanzees and seemed to be closely associated with their emotional state. Anxiety, affection, anger, their feelings of well-being. Once a chimpanzee learned what the figure stood for, would its reaction to them tell us something about its emotional state? To make sure the chimpanzees were responding to the symbols for clinging and play, and not the men themselves, we used costumes and masks. We changed the people inside the costumes and the positions of the figures in the room to make sure the chimpanzees associated the figure in white with play and the figure in green with clinging. Before long, the chimpanzees spent most of their time playing, usually the rougher the better. It certainly looked like they were having a lot of fun but it was easy to make them stop playing and cling. We're going to surprise this chimpanzee. Watch his reaction. It looks like the bell startled the animal and he went to the cling figure because he was afraid. Clinging seemed to reduce his fear. Watch what happened a few days later, after he'd heard the bell a few times. The bell, instead of making him cling, this time appeared to make him play harder. How could a frightening stimulus like the bell produce more vigorous play? Suppose the first few bells produced a large increase in excitement. This was frightening to him, and clinging occurred. Suppose further that the effectiveness of the bell decreased as the chimpanzee became accustomed to it. It would still produce excitement, but not as much. This could stimulate him to play harder. In this way, the same stimulus could result in clinging or play, depending on how much it increased excitement. This was an intriguing idea, and we were able to test it in another way. We worked with six different pairs of young chimpanzees and recorded their normal behavior. Very little time was spent in clinging. Most of their activity was play of some kind. Then we separated them for a brief time. Watch what happened. Their level of excitement increased dramatically. When reunited, they should cling. But how would this increased arousal affect play? The results of many such tests for the six pairs of animals showed a very high percentage of clinging in the first few minutes. And then the clinging dropped down to the normal level. But we noticed a response that seemed to bear out what we'd seen in other experiments. When the animals were separated briefly, the amount of play increased significantly over what we'd observed in chimpanzees under normal conditions the distress of being separated seemed to have made them play more. This substantiated the results of our earlier tests. A strong stimulus, even a distressing one, could increase play rather than diminish it. How would a pair of young chimpanzees react when their level of arousal was raised even higher? We did this by separating them for a longer time. Chimpanzees were kept apart for an hour, and we kept a record of their activity. Thank <laughs> you.
brought them together, we expected them to cling. But would the increased excitement make them play more or less? Results showed that after the initial cling interval, the chimpanzees did more playing after a brief separation than after a longer separation. This gave further support to the idea that moderate amounts of arousal could stimulate playing rather than clinging. Dr. Mason could test his idea in another way. Remember the room where he had experimented with the chimpanzees' level of arousal and the various kinds of stimuli that would tend to make them cling or play? From his previous tests, he knew the individual personalities of each chimpanzee. This is Doug, a well-adjusted, active young male who shows a strong tendency towards activity with the familiar play figure. What would he do when confronted by a strange new figure? When Doug is returned to the test room, he will be confronted by the stranger and the familiar cling figure. You can guess what his reaction will be. Evidence such as this convinced us that a strong stimulus, such as the strange figure, raised the chimpanzee's level of arousal so high, he resorted to clinging to bring it back down. This could be considered equivalent to the initial cling period in the separation experiments. When the high level of arousal has been reduced by clinging, he feels secure enough to investigate the stranger at closer range. But when the stranger responds by initiating play, arousal is increased. Doug becomes anxious. He returns to the green figure. By clinging, he reduces arousal, and his anxiety is brought under control. What will Doug do when the cling figure is no longer present, and only the stranger and the familiar play figure are available to him? In this situation, he makes only a brief contact with the play figure and then withdraws. Why? Our view is that the strange figure, just because it is strange, raises the level of arousal to the point where any further increase would be disturbing. Since play increases arousal, Doug avoids play. He just sits. In time, as the stranger becomes more familiar, Doug's arousal decreases. He begins to play with the white figure in the presence of the stranger. Still later, he makes his first contact with the stranger. Eventually, he may even prefer to play with the stranger. After many such experiments, our findings suggest that the chimpanzee's emotional state his fear, anger, affection, feelings of well-being is very much dependent on his level of arousal. We believe play and clinging, by acting on arousal level, help the chimpanzee to keep its emotional life under control. As we continue these studies, we're finding out what happens when young chimpanzees have to get along without these emotional controls. This infant is being raised without contact with other chimpanzees. The blanket gives it some security. It has become a substitute for clinging. This one has developed repetitive, bizarre patterns of behavior, remarkably similar to the symptoms often seen in certain emotionally disturbed children. She clings to herself because nothing else is available. 
Much of what the young chimpanzee does is based on instinctive mechanisms. But the traditional drives of hunger, thirst, and sex cannot account for most of its behavior. As a result of our experiments, we believe that play and clinging not only help him maintain his emotional balance, but are of fundamental importance to the development of a normal young chimpanzee. These studies of the early social life of the chimpanzee suggest new ways of looking at the development of human personality. Why do children cling? The question cannot be answered by assuming it simply helps them to reduce their anxiety. Nor can children's desire for play be explained by merely saying they enjoy it. Such basic human behavior is very complex, and our knowledge of what's behind it is far from complete but we are beginning to see that the early development of our own emotional life is an elaboration and refinement of the same fundamental mechanisms we've seen in the social behavior of young chimpanzees. As scientists like Dr. Mason continue to probe deeper into the early social behavior of animals like my friend here, they learn more about comparable behavior in ourselves. Our common primate ancestor has had a powerful effect on us both. We may not be alike in many ways, but we are alike in enough ways. The further exploration of the childhood of the chimpanzee is a rich source for experiment.